everyone, and welcome. This is Michael Cavaccini. I have the pleasure today of interviewing Christina Farley. Uh, she's a successful writer with multiple books to her name, including one coming out uh, in November, The Dream Heist, which I'm excited for. I already have it pre-ordered. Uh, if you don't, you should too, uh, because it's a very exciting book, which we're going to learn more about today. So, Christina, thank you for joining me, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great, great. Yeah, so... I always find, I mean, let's kind of kick things off with your journey as a writer. I, one thing I find really interesting is that almost every writer didn't just start off as a writer. They usually had some sort of profession prior to that. Uh, and oftentimes, whatever they did before becoming an author um, influences their writing. You know, for example, Lisa Scatellini used to be a lawyer, and she's written many legal thrillers. James Patterson was involved in advertising and God knows he markets and advertises his books better than anyone on the planet. So uh, you know, what is your background prior to writing and how do you think it influenced what you do today? My background is teaching and you're hundred percent right. It had a huge influence on my writing. I started off writing <clears throat> mainly for children because I was a teacher um, and I started off with working on magazine articles like highlights and fun for kids and boys quest and and things like that um and i also wrote for moms um, magazines as well so i did a lot of that type of writing beforehand um and then it was actually when i was living in korea that we moved there and i was so inspired by the culture and the people and just i really fell in love with korea we had just been living in Indonesia previously and we moved to Korea and Indonesia was great, but there was something about Korea that was very inspirational. And so while I was there, I started writing pretty furiously and I was trying, meanwhile, I was teaching seventh graders and sixth graders and, and I was trying to get my students excited to write as well. And they weren't having anything to do with it. So I'm like, well, how about I write some stories and we're, since we're doing myths, we can write a story on a myth, you can write stories and I'll put in my story, you, into the story. And they're like, okay, okay, that sounds great. And so I started writing this story and just fell in love with it. And I joined a critique group and started developing my craft even more. And my students said, write more. So I did, and that ended up becoming Gilded, the first in the Gilded series. So that was pretty exciting. That was my first, that was my debut novel in the end. Um, and I was very passionate about that story because it really was um, of my life. It was my life. Like I wrote about what I saw and the people that were in my life and my students. And and I got to write at the palace. Um, many of my scenes were in the different cafes. And so the cafes in the book are the cafes that I wrote at. So I really agree with what you have to say. Like that has a big impact on what inspires you. And also, I think in turn, like what inspires you makes your writing better. It makes it more interesting because you're in love with it. And so it just spills out into the writing. So that's kind of how awesome. I began. That's awesome. Really exciting. Um, and I think it's really interesting to, um, oh, there's kind of a few things that I always think of questions as I'm hearing people answer my previous question. Because I'm just like, wow, okay, it made me think of all these, these 10 different things. Uh, so the first thing is um, the setting. The setting is really interesting because, I mean, would you kind of classify your writing as a kind of young adult? Um, well, first off, would you? Because uh, I, I believe that's what, I've, at least how Amazon has kind of designated, yeah. you know, yeah, books you Gilded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and you know, you're, are you of Korean descent at all? Or is it just that you happen no. to be living there? So you're like, hey, I was I'm living there and there. teaching I'm there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right, which is really unique because I, you know, I'm Italian, so it's understandable for like again, Lisa Scalini is writing a book set in Italy next year. Um, like, cool. of course, she's Italian, right? But what is it like writing a book set in a culture that's kind of foreign to you? Even though you're there and you're living it and you're kind of among the people, it's not necessarily like you have some sort of uh, lineage when it comes to that culture. So I assume you're probably trying to treat it with a lot of reverence, um, but it's also fascinating for you I imagine too because you're kind of learning as you're researching and writing and all of these other things so what is that like kind of like an outsider on the inside writing about um 
yeah, this uh, distinct culture that inspired you? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back, going back to what you love and what you're passionate about. So I think everything you start with starts with that. Um, And then also what you know, like, this is what I knew. This was my life. Um, These are the students that I was a part of and the, and the people I was a part of. So in many ways, like my boys, we always joke around like Korea is home for us. And because we lived there for so long, nearly a decade. Um, you know, I'm Jewish, I'm part Jewish descent, and I'm also a part English descent. And I'll be honest, I couldn't sit there and write a story set in England um, and the British culture. I don't know anything about it. I mean, of course, I love Jane Austen. She's my far just, I'm a descendant of the Austen family. Um, and so I would love to write a story set in Britain, um, maybe based on Jane Austen, because she is my ancestor. Um, but I don't feel like I'm qualified right yet because I need to learn that culture a lot better. I need to understand the culture and, and live it. So, um, yeah, I think it just, it just goes back to what you know, what you're comfortable with, where your passions lie. I think there's a lot of parts to it. So, you know, when I was writing that, like, you know, I would write about what I was seeing and what I was doing. And that's kind of where I started from. And yeah. went from there. It was a while ago when I wrote that. It was, gosh, more than 10 years ago. So going on close to 15 years ago. So it was a long time that I wrote that book. Yeah. That, and did you say you're a descendant of Jane Austen? How did you find that out? <laughs> um, my uncle. It was so funny because he knows everything about our family history. So he's done all the kind of research and he has on the all the documents from our family. So, yeah. Um, we always joke around about the, the Austin family isn't the best uh, upholding standing <laughs> family. <laughs> but um, I do have that card that I'm, yeah, I'm distantly related to her um, through one of her brothers. So, her oh, that's awesome. Uh, and did you find that out after you got into writing? And you're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Yes, actually, the irony is I did. I mean, I knew that my family was. We have my mom is is in Austin, so I knew that, but I didn't know that I was actually a direct descendant um, from her family um, until my uncle was like, "Well, you know that we're not just Austins, but we are direct descendants from uh, a family member of her." So I was like, "Oh, okay, well that's interesting." So he's like, "That's probably where you got your writing from." I'm like, "I don't know, but it's cool because I think she's awesome." Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Like if I found out that I was somehow related to Stephen King. I'd be like, all right, that's uh, pretty badass. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So when it comes to writing, um, yeah, I, I've been to uh, many conferences, Thriller Fest specifically, have been several years, and uh, hearing these amazing writers, Lee Child and you know, Steve Berry, and just uh, these incredible, uh, t- incredibly talented people, uh, Anne Rice, talk about the writing process. I, I find that some of them are very much, um, they like to, to map things out. Steve Berry is all about, you know, act one, act two, act three. He writes everything out. Stephen James, who I adore, and I'm going to be interviewing soon, believes in what he calls more like organic storytelling, where as he's writing it, he's kind of discovering it with the reader. So like, he's kind of like, okay, they open the trunk of the car. What's the worst thing that they can find inside of the trunk of this car? And then he writes it. And I'm like, I love that. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do you approach it where you, are you structured? And if you're structured, how do you make sure you're not so structured that you kind of put yourself to sleep? Because I assume if you know everything that's going to happen, it can be a little bit like, oh, well then why am I gonna bother writing, you know? So how do you handle that, you know, keeping organized, but also keeping it exciting. Well, I have done both ways because I've heard that it was good to try both, you know, both methods. And so I did. Um, I have found that I like the structure better, um, mainly because I'm a busy mom. Um, I have a lot of things going on and I, it's hard to, when I find I do kind of more discovery writing, I get myself into, I always fall into the cliche. And so I always go to the first thing I think of. And that is a problem I feel like sometimes when you're, especially for me, I'm writing thrillers and I'm writing fantasy and my readers are expecting to be surprised. They're expecting to be interested in what's happening and they want those twists and turns. And that's really hard to do, especially in a thriller, is to do those twists and turns without really plotting those in and and like embedding those into the story. 
So I have found, especially if you're doing mysteries, thrillers, and for the fantasy, I find it helpful to plot it because you want unique fantasy. You don't want to have the same thing that the readers are going to be seeing. Um, so I love plotting it. It keeps me from rewriting too much and um, keeps me on the right path. Now that said, um, when I go to plot out my parts of my story, I always try to think about like, if I wanna come to a new fantasy setting or a new fantasy idea, I wanna think about 10 different ways to look at this. Like how can I make this as exciting and interesting as possible? And so I go with that, I start with that. Now I'm gonna be honest with you, like when I start writing, I will often deviate from my initial idea because actually I thought of something even better than I had before. And then I just go and have fun with that. So I think sometimes I have to write what I want to, I had planned. And so then that's a challenge for me to like, how can I make this even more exciting than I had it in my head? And hopefully, you know, it comes out that way on paper. So it's always a challenge. And then of course, when you write scenes, sometimes things happen that you weren't expecting. You're like, oh, wow, like who is this character? Like they weren't supposed to be in the book and I am a plotter. So they, didn't show, they weren't in the book. This is really bizarre and weird, but exciting. So I do allow for those moments to happen and I go with them and I follow through and see where that trail takes me and I go with it. And that's part of the creative process. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I'm I've n never written a novel. I eventually hope to, but I write all the time. And yeah. whether it's a blog post or it's an article like for work or something, I tend to kind of have what I would call like the subheadings where I would say, okay, I'm going to do like, like these are kind of like the topics I'm going to hit on. Yeah. And then as I write them, uh, I just kind of roll with it. And if I get inspired, I'm just like, all right, let's just like kind of like you almost get like a, a I don't say a trance but like a zone and yeah. then sometimes right down here influences what's up here so then you have to kind of go back up there I actually find that at least with you know more like um, essay type writing I kind of leave the introduction alone I, I tend to try to write the middle and the end and then I come back to the beginning to say okay now that I've written this yeah. how do I want to lead into all that yeah um, I, and I, I'm not sure with a book when it comes to like a novel are you going chronologically because it makes sense to do that? Or do you find that like with a book, you're trying to grab the reader with that first sentence, that first chapter where they go, oh, I have to buy this. I have to read this. So do you actually tend to write that at the end or do you write that up front? So first chapters and I don't get along. <laughs> <laughs> that is so hard. First lines are the hardest and I will agonize. Like usually it takes me about a year to write a book. I will agonize over that first line for about a year. And it's first chapter. And I usually have found that I write the whole book and the first chapter, I have to rewrite it numerous times to get it right after I finish the book. Because that first chapter is so pivotal. There is so much work that that first chapter is putting into the story. They're you know, setting up the tone, the voice, the hook, the characters, the plot line, and they're giving the back history and the forward history. I mean, all these things. And sometimes as a writer, like, I've read a lot of books and I, I am still overwhelmed by that first chapter. So instead of like stressing myself out, I just think, okay, I'm going to write a really bad first chapter and that's okay. And then I'll write the rest of the book and kind of get a feel of what's happening in the story. Because even though I plot heavily, there is still so much that I don't know about my story. And when I go back to rewrite, I'm realizing I have to revamp all this stuff. So I don't give myself that pressure on the first draft. Now, when I get to like the third draft, that first chapter has this needs to start being really good. It needs to start hitting the marks. And sometimes that can be stressful, but um, it can be exciting too. It's, it's the challenge. So yeah, first chapters. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> it's really interesting. And I think one of the things I've heard that, that really resonated with me is that sometimes you see writers uh, they could be on Twitter, wherever, and they're like, oh, I have writer's block, what do I do? And the, uh, I've interviewed, I mean, Lisa Scalini, Harlan Cobb, and Lee Child, like, you know, number one New York Times bestselling authors. And for, number one, they're all insecure, right? They, it doesn't matter if you're a number one bestselling author yeah. or you're unknown, uh, you're insecure uh, to a certain degree. And I actually think that's a good thing because if you're insecure, it means you care and you're trying. Um, but uh, a lot of them will say writer's block isn't really a thing. It doesn't exist. It's in your head. 
you know, if you just start writing, then um, you're fine. And, and it kind of, I thought of that because you're talking about revising. And someone said to me once that, you know, all you got to do is write that first crappy draft, then you revise it and make it good. So like, don't get caught up in this. Uh, oh, it needs to be a masterpiece. The first thing I write, literally just get whatever's in your head out onto paper and then make it beautiful. Uh, and that way you really won't have writer's block because you'll, you can just like spit out this first draft and then it's just, you know, refine, refine, refine. I mean, do you find that that works for you or are you ever just like one of these people who's like sitting there with like a cup of tea waiting for inspiration? <laughs> no, I, I a hundred percent agree with you. And I think for me, that's why when I write my first drafts, I don't revise much um, because I find it, it so it starts putting pressure on me. Um, I start getting hung up on things I shouldn't. And then it just disrupts the flow of my storytelling, I guess. Um, so I give myself permission to write a really bad draft. And I say, it's okay if it's a bad draft, because then I can go back and look and think how far I've come. And it's almost like the moment I've done that, it's very freeing. And so then I'm just kind of in the zone of the story. I'm not worried about mechanics. I'm not worried about descriptions or even like little technical parts of the plot. I'm worried about the story. And so when I'm typing, I'm it's like I'm watching a movie and I'm just kind of watching and seeing how it unfolds. And then once I finish it and I know it's going to be horrible, I'm going to admit my second drafts are, they're bad. I mean, they're just, when I go to look at them, I'm like, oh no, like what did I do to myself? Um, but, you know, you have something to work with now. You, you have scenes to work with. And also you haven't spent, you know, um, a week on chapter five that you're going to throw out. Like, because I do that all the time. I'll realize I don't need this chapter at all. Or I, I've set this whole part up wrong. I need to redo it. And so I've, I don't waste days on something that I'm just going to throw out. So I like that um, because time is valuable. Um, as a writer. And so that to me is a big part of it is that just giving yourself that freedom. And because there's, there's so much pressure enough on us as writers, we don't need anything else to kind of inhibit us. So let yourself be free and let yourself play and just play in the world and just have fun. And then later on, you can hone it and, and put it through the fire and make it beautiful. But until that moment, just just have fun. That's great. And um, I don't know about you, but I grew up being read to. Um, I didn't actually appreciate writing until I was in high school. I think I read a sports autobiography and then I think of an autobiography by a wrestler. Um, and I was like, wow, this is reading is fun. And yeah. then I read the James Patterson book and I was like, whoa, these chapters are like three minutes long and this is incredible and it's like reading an action movie like I because I was used to whatever I was required to read which I thought was not entertaining and kind of turned me off and then I kind of had to discover reading for myself outside you know fairy tales and things that my parents would read me as a child you know, did you kind of ever have that struggle too where you had to um, find what appealed to you or were you just into everything right from the get-go no, I I was very similar. I was read to as a kid. My dad read me uh, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, C.S. Lewis, a lot of the fantasy. Um, you know, all the classics. He would sit down every night and would read to me, and I loved it. Um, so I did fall in love with storytelling at a very young age. Um, that said, I struggled as a reader. I was not a very good student. I had a hard time reading. I had a hard time in school. And I remember my first grade teacher telling me that I, I may never like get to get to college. Like I might not be good enough um, as, a, as a student. And I remember I will never forget sitting there trying to read the story of Spot jumped over the log or something like that. And I remember looking at the story thinking, this is so boring. Like, why do I want to read this? And here my teacher's telling me, like, you just got to keep trying. You might graduate from high school if you keep trying. And I remember thinking, I want to graduate from high school. I, I want to go get a college degree. And I have never forgotten that. And then it wasn't until middle school that I, I started, my parents forced me to read because our family always goes to, to Israel, you know, when we turn 12 years old. 
And so I was supposed to go to Israel and take a trip through the country. And I couldn't go until I read all the books that were required, my parents required of me. So I sat down and read those books. I really wanted to go to, to Israel. And um, <laughs> um, once I did that, I was like, wow, like this is, I can do this. I can find books that I like. And I read Watership Down, which is one of the biggest books to start reading, which crazy, but I love that story. And I have been hooked on reading since. So I think a lot of it is sometimes you need to be forced to read stuff. Um, and then sometimes you just have to find those books that you can really connect with. And sometimes we don't give ourselves those opportunities. We don't explore enough of those stories to do that. And I think as a writer, it's the same way. Like exploring different types of writing is the powerful experience because when you try different types of things it really gives you that creative freedom and it allows you to see okay I'm good at writing this type of fiction or I'm good at writing this type of nonfiction, or I'm really good at writing poetry that's kind of my go-to and you don't know it until you explore those things so I think it goes hand in hand with reading and with writing yeah yeah you're right because some people um are um like I said, not really in love with reading. And I believe it's like, really, I think it's just under half the population like reads books for fun. I think it's pretty, something pretty low where you're just like, wow, um, it should be much higher. And uh, I remember I, was, I, I, I know someone I, I, I went to school with and she had tweeted one time and she's a communications professional and she tweeted one time, I haven't read anything this year. And this was like halfway through the year or something. And she's like, you know, um, what should I read or something? And I was just like, even if that's true, which obviously it was, I'm like, I would not admit that. I mean, because if you're being paid to write and you are like volunteering the fact that you don't read, uh, I, I just yeah. was like, ah, like good writers read, right? And, and good writers read good writers and bad writers. So that way you can learn from both. Uh, but, uh, and something I think that helps break down the barriers, which I didn't know as a child, but now I do and I, enjoy them all the time are audiobooks and i have a newborn um which i don't know with my blurred background it might not be obvious but i'm in his nursery and uh, i think that audiobooks are probably a great way to get kids into books because the production value and just the what they do now like i, I was i was like feeding him and like listen i played a fairy tale on audible for him to listen to mm -hmm. he's probably not even aware of what the heck's playing but i just figure you know, just playing books and stories and things can make it fun, no different than music. So I mean, what are your thoughts on kind of uh, audiobooks that are, are really booming right now and their ability to connect with younger readers or even just adults who said, ah, oh, you know, I don't want to read a thousand page Stephen King book. Well, guess what? You can listen to it and be entertained and you still read it. Uh, and then the, how has that applied to your books and, and brought your work to life? Yeah, I mean, I 100% agree with you. Um, I did a lot of audiobooks with my, my two boys. So we used to travel a lot because we lived overseas. We traveled all around the world. And then even when we came back and moved to Florida, we would go have like a 20 to 30 minute drive to school. And so every day we would listen to an audiobook and I get them at the library or um, usually at the library and we just put it in and then the boys would listen to the stories and it made the trip a lot easier because we're all listening to stories but it was also a great kind of connection for us because even though we were driving we were using our time to kind of create imaginative stories in our heads but then later on we got to talk about it and share about it and what we liked about the stories and my boys vocabulary is just through the roof their reading skills are through the roof because not only do they like to read books themselves um but they we did a lot of audiobooks like a lot over their whole elementary middle school years. <laughs> so I highly recommend it. And I love audiobooks. And I, I like to take them, like, if I'm going for a walk, I will listen to an audiobook. Um, there's just another way to explore storytelling. And it's just kind of allows you to kind of take a break. Maybe if you're cleaning the house or you're making dinner or there's just, it gives you a chance to listen to stories in another, in another way. Um, so I love them and I'm super excited because Blackstone Publishing bought the Dream Heist, the audio version for the Dream Heist, and they're in production with that right now. And I just cannot wait 
to see how they produce that story. Um, so we're really excited about it. It will be, you know, promoted to the school market, but also to the adult market because even though the characters are teens, um, not all of them are teens. Some of them are adults. And this is something that actually that I do very, um, I make a point of doing this in a lot of my stories is I bring characters from many different generations. So I have in, in you know, area, she's a teenager, she's, um, she's 18, but then her dad is in the story. He's a part of the story. He's, you know, her father. And then there's also, um, characters who are in the twenties who work with her, they're her workmates. And so I have, you know, people from all different types of generations and backgrounds as a part of the story so that people, you know, teens can identify with it, but also adults can identify with the story too, because I don't want to just limit my books to one audience. Um, I mean, some, some books I do like the princess in the page it's for, it's for younger readers, but um, in my YA stories, I tend to try to write for teens, but also like, Adults could enjoy them as well. So, yeah, yeah, congratulations on that uh, audiobook deal with Blackstone for Dream Heist. Um, I actually came across you uh, by, uh, it's funny, you don't know how you're going to discover a writer, but I was looking at Kindle Vela and I saw that you had, um, well, you know, these chapters. So for people who don't know what Kindle Vela is, uh, it's really kind of like this, like, these like serial stories so it's almost like a chapter at a time and you pay with like these tokens um and you're just kind of it's like episodic right where you you're uh, but a, as a writer i mean explain to me that process and how did you come across kindle vela uh and dream heist was you know that that's where i saw that and then i was like oh okay it's going to also be released as like a, a complete book and you know then I decided to reach out and here we are. But, you know, tell me about your, your experience working with the Kindle Vela platform, you know, what you think it offers and um, just, you know, any thoughts you have to share about that? Yeah, so this is the first time that I've done serialized writing. Um, and I actually got into it because of Beth Revis. She's a very close friend of mine and she decided to do it um, join Kindle Vela and she's like let's do this together and I'm like okay we used to critique do a lot of critiquing together over the years and we've gotten busy lately but um, I love her stories by the way I highly recommend her um, but yeah so we decided to you know try this serialized writing and I had this story that I had started on the dream heist and it was kind of in the works and looking at it and and I thought well this might be a really great platform for it because it's a thriller it's fast paced I can, you know, chunk it up a little bit, you know, shorter chapters. Um, and so I thought it might be a good location for that. So I decided to give it a go. And I was in, I got in when, you know, Kindle Vela first opened, like opening day, I, my story was on there. And it has done so well. Like, I'm just surprised at the response that readers have given the story and really happy with it. it hit number three at one point on all stories on Kindle Vela and oh. yeah it's I don't even know how many reads it's gotten but it's over a hundred thousand reads I mean it's just like crazy and I'm just like wow like that blew me away and I also I really enjoyed it because I felt like I had a it kind of bridged that gap between me and the readers because I was able to write in the author notes wh what inspired these scenes, um, kind of share my excitement for what I was writing. And the cool thing about the dream heist is there's a lot of research that was put into the story about dream therapy. Um, and also the whole story is based on a real bank, a cyber bank heist that really happened. So I was kind of able to give little details about the bank heist that I couldn't give in the story because it wasn't really natural. Um, so. I put that into the author notes. And then I also, they started doing this poll feature so that you could ask the readers, like, what would you like to see next in the story? Or who are your favorite characters? Or what parts of the story do you like the best? Or what do you think will happen next? And so those are the kind of questions I started asking. And suddenly I was getting responses from them like, oh, this is what they like. Or this is their favorite character. And, and I love that. Like, wow. Like I had never bridged that gap between myself and the readers before. So I felt like it was a lot more intimate way to tell a story, which I really loved. And then in my social media, I started posting pictures that were based on the story, like places that I had visited, because in the story, it's 
it's based on a real bank heist, but I have actually visited a lot of those places like Hong Kong. I've been to Hong Kong. I've been to um, um, the Philippines and all those different places, Florida, of course. Um, so, you know, all those different places that are in the story are places that I've been. And I was able to kind of share some of my experiences in that. And then I did a season two um, and that's set in Peru because we went to go, we went to Peru last last um, November. And while I was there, I'm like, oh, this would be a really fun place for a thriller, like the Amazon jungle and Lima and so many cool places. And so I used all of my travel locations and did the story on those. I have a catacomb scene based on the catacombs there. So that was really fun to just kind of have fun with writing. Like it really took down that that barrier that sometimes a book has where you have to follow this certain regimen, you have to do these certain things and you, you, you publish the whole thing and it's done and then you give it to the reader. So suddenly there's that, that's gone and it's a different way to tell a story. Um, and I learned a lot as a writer. Like I, it really challenged me as a writer, which is so important. I think we should always be challenging ourselves and that makes us better yeah. writers. So um, yeah, it, it's been a wild, a wild year, but really awesome at the same time. That's really interesting. So with the Kindle Vela, uh, when it comes to the, I guess, you know, uh, first off, how does the final novel differ from your Kindle Vela story? Like when people are giving this feedback, did that actually influence what you were writing or what had you already written what you wrote? And then you're like, oh, wait a minute, should I try to change that <laughs> based on this feedback and then when you had a complete novel did you were there any additional changes that kind of came about um because now it's kind of in this different format yeah so for the dream heist um it's actually it two seasons there's the dream heist and the dream hunt is basically how i label them so the dream heist is pretty much the same as in Kindle Vela, not, there's some things that I edited and once I went through my editor and did my final edits and stuff like that, I cleaned it up and kind of focused, structure some things a little differently, but that's pretty much the same as it will be. Now the dream hunt, because I was writing those kind of more, a lot faster and more in the moment, that is going to need, when I go, when I go to work on that one, I haven't done that yet, but I'm going to have to restructure some things. I'm going to probably add some more scenes in there that I, I didn't have before. I'm thinking I'm going to add some other points of view. So that's going to need a lot more work and it's going to need another round of edits um, that I'm going to have to do. But, um, you know, I think it just depends on what you're doing and what you're writing. And some people don't put these in book formats and some people do. Um, but I think it's kind of like, I think of it like a TV series. That's a lot what it's like. So, you know, you're having a TV series and you have all these characters and you have this world. And so you're developing everything from that world and going from there. So, I, you know, going back, now I'm, I just started a new um, Kindle Vela called Immortal Secret. And I've structured yep. that one a little bit differently um, because I learned so much from the Dream Heist. And the Dream Heist was great. It was wonderful. But this one, I'm making a little bit bigger world. I started right away with three different points of view, which I've never done before, but it's kind of exciting. And uh, once again, stretching yourself as a writer, it's a great way to do that. Um, and so I'm making the world pretty large with lots of characters that I can pull from, and then I can deviate from different stories and hopefully have a longer serial, longer spanning serial that I can just keep going for years. I would like to do that, which would be, pretty fun and really cool. Yeah, so how do you figure out the frequency? Um, not just the beginning and the end point, but how frequently you should be putting these out. I mean, I'm looking at the Mortal Secret here on my uh, uh, yeah. Fire tablet, and it says that the last update was September 25th. Next episode is October 2nd, and it says update frequency 10 in the last 30 days. So in the beginning, do you re release like kind of a whole batch and then you're like, okay, once a month or every other week, or like, what do you, what kind of cadence have you found works? Yeah, I feel like I definitely understand Vela a lot more than I did when with Dream Heist. And part of it is because when Dream Heist launched, Kindle Vela was brand new. <laughs> so it's all new. So I would recommend if you are going to do a Kindle Vela story, just start off with a bunch, like um, between five to eight episodes, because your first three episodes are free and you won't start 
making money or coins from that until they get to the later episodes. So that's how I recommend to do that. And then I also recommend to release one episode every, at least once a week or whatever you decide to do, be consistent. So you all, your readers know like, okay, so for me, every time, every Sunday, I'm going to have an episode drop. So readers can expect that and that you're always showing up for them when they need you to show up. So that helps. And then ideally, you know, you want to have a kind of an idea, your whole plot kind of figured out for your whole season, especially the first season of what you want to do and where you want to go. And, and once you have that plotted out, at least you can have that to kind of build from as you start writing, unless you've already written. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because um, while Kindle Vela is not necessarily available on the Kindle e-readers, you can read it on your tablet, which mm -hmm. I find is actually a pretty good experience. Um, your phone, whatever. And we're in this world now where everyone loves stuff on demand. We like to stream things. We like to, but at the same time, we also enjoy not just binging, which you can do with these because if you're releasing, you know, like a bunch in the beginning, you can kind of binge your way through these episodes like you would show on Netflix, but then also kind of like, oh, Handmaid's Tales every Wednesday. People could be like, oh, The Immortal Secret is every Sunday, so I'm going to tune in and, you know, read that new episode. So it kind of leans in to the way we're consuming entertainment um, across other mediums, too. Exactly. It really is interesting. And, you know, as a writer, it's always good to find different outlets and different ways to share your stories. I think it's a really good thing. So for me, I'm, I'm just having a lot of fun with it and just having a lot of fun playing in this world that I'm creating. And I think that's important for us as creative people to have that avenue because I'm still writing for other stuff. Like I, I just sent my agent a full novel of something totally different that she's got. And so I'm waiting for her feedback from her. Um, so, you know, I'm still doing other things too, but this is kind of like my little playground that I can just play and have fun and um, go from there. Yeah, that's awesome. I interviewed an author, I think it was last month, and um, he blew me away in the fact that he's been, he makes about $400,000 a year self-published, primarily through Kindle Unlimited. I did not realize until I spoke to him just how lucrative Kindle Unlimited is for self-published authors, because it's based, I think, on pages read. And if you have enough books out there and people are reading them, and it's like a series and all that. I mean, you could make an, a hell of a living. So, I mean, have you, I, I assume with Kindle Vella, I mean, you're, you're pretty much self-publishing, but have you self-published, and you, you've, you've titles in Kindle Unlimited. So what has your experience been like when it comes, I'm not saying, you know, tell me your money, but your finances, yeah, but I'm <laughs> just curious, like, when it, uh, have you found that you've been surprised at how, um, uh, you know, effective it's been not only to, to creatively uh, express yourself, but also, like make a living doing something that you love. So yeah, well, first of all, I think it's really, it's not that we are going to talk about money, but I think as writers, it's important to talk about money too, because, you know, we're trying to make a living off this too. And we're trying to do something with our craft. Um, so I don't, I don't take offense to that at all. Um, now my Gilda series are through my publisher and my publisher has um, Skyscape. They have um, the rights to that. So they put that in Kindle unlimited so i don't know how gotcha. that exactly works but okay. the dream heist will be going into kindle unlimited under my company for the first time so i'm really excited about it um and so i don't know i don't know anything about it and how it's going to work or if i'm going to like it i don't know um my other stuff is through my publishers classic has my my middle grade and then mm -hmm. the audio will be through blackstone and my other audio is through brilliance and then um, Kindle Vela, though, I have done really well with Kindle Vela. It's one of my most successful titles, um, Dream Heist. I made the most money through that story, almost more, like not as much as the Gilded, as Gilded, because Gilded has done well um, in other ways. That I, some ways I can't talk about right yet, but hopefully soon I can talk about. Um, but Gilded has done very well. Um, but my other books, I mean, my second best selling title is The Dream Heist um, through Kindle Vela. So it has been really a, a really big thing for me and I've done really well with that. So that's why I'm continuing it. And, um, you know, traditional publishing is, is great, but it is something, there's something nice to have that is your own and you have power in your, what to do what you want with it. 
And there's a lot of power in that. So, I mean, I still will hope to continue to, you know, go through traditional publishing, but I definitely want to continue to doing my own stuff as well. And I think if I could forever be hybrid, that would be ideal um, in my world. But um, I think, you know, self-publishing is a really viable option. And I think especially these days, like authors are really savvy. Like you can hire your own editors, you can get hire your own, you know, covers, you can design your own covers, you can do stuff that you could never do before. In the last few years, things have come so far. So that's exciting. And it's really another way for authors to, you know, share their work and and still keep their creative elements to them. So it's a good thing. Yeah, it's great. And uh, one thing I think that people don't realize is that uh, readers don't really care uh, who the publisher is, right? Um, people don't say, if you if you read a great story and you're like, oh, you've got to read this book by you know, Tom Smith, it's just riveting. Your friend's not going to be like, uh, did Harper Collins publish that? No, they're going to just say, okay, cool. Oh, it's in Kindle yes. Unlimited? Great. I can just borrow it and enjoy yeah. it and awesome. No one exactly. cares about who publishes a book. They just want to know, is it a good book? Yeah. Um, and another kind of myth um, is that uh, some people think, oh, if it's self-published, it's going to be all sorts of typos and issues and whatever. And yes, that is a possibility. But I've read books uh, by HarperCollins and other publishers where there are typos and there are issues. And you can actually, on Kindle now, in the Kindle bookstore, it will tell you if there are reported errors, like right on the sale page. It'll say like, it'll say like reported, you know, that there's typos or this or that, and we're working on fixing it. Um and so, yeah, it, just because something is done by a traditional publisher does not necessarily mean that it is inherently of higher quality or that the reader even cares uh, about that yeah. fact. I think sometimes it's just like like the the people from like, you know, the old the old um, way of doing things might get caught up and, um, ooh, I got a, a book deal with so-and-so. But it's I think it's at the same time, I think it's awesome that publishers are perfectly fine with, hey, we're going to work with you on this book, and then you can be doing your self-publishing thing over here. Um, so you can enjoy that best of both worlds experience because, you know, there are benefits to both. So that's awesome to hear. And so for this author that I interviewed uh, recently, he basically was a, a, a meteorologist, and he said that on, once he started to make it three, uh, double or three times whatever he was making, uh, as a meteorologist, as an author, then he's like, okay, I'm going to quit my day job and just write. I mean, for you, did, did you, were you doing the, the when well, you were doing the teaching while writing, but like, when did you reach that moment? And I don't even know if you have, where you said, okay, I'm just going to do this because I've kind of hit my number or whatever that is. Did you have like some sort of milestone in your head where you say, okay, now I'm a writer full time? Yeah, so right now I am a writer full time, but I also write for Florida Virtual School and I do work with them as well. So I do have a, a job that gives me some stability, um, but they also have a job that's very flexible and I really like that. Um, I'm thinking I'm never going to be, I'm going to keep that for as long as I can. I mean, I don't know. Like, I just, I feel like it's nice to have some a steady paycheck that comes in and I don't have to worry about it. Um, but if I have too many projects that I feel like I can't juggle at all and I need, I, you know, my writing is taking over of that, then yeah, maybe I would go full-time writing. Um, but it, it is nice to have, you know, multiple streams of income. I love having that, um, and having a lot more flexibility and also not having the pressure of my writing, having to always produce on my writing. Like I want that also to be. Yes, I am making good money on it, but I want it to be still fun and creative and not have that pressure. Like I have to write this. And if I don't get this done in this time, it's going to be, it's going to be a problem. Um, we're not going to make the, the bills, you know, our, pay, our house payment or something like that. So I do like having a little bit of that flexibility, but, um, but I was able to quit teaching which was huge because teaching was very draining for me. I mean, I love being a teacher and I do a lot of school visits and stuff like that, but um, it was, you know, it's a pretty draining job and it's pretty intense. And so being able to quit teaching was a huge thing for me. So I'm very thankful I was able to do that through my writing. 
Yeah, no, that's. Uh, I actually taught at um, Temple University a night class up until COVID. Then COVID mm-hmm. happened, and they were like, "Oh, we want you to teach on campus." They were like trying to do hybrid, and this is before right. the vaccine. And I'm like, "No, thank you," because I don't want to deal with potentially getting sick or trying to enforce the students wearing face masks yeah. all for the same amount of money. I'm like, "Nah, I'm, I'm good." Um, but yeah, that, that's really interesting. The uh, yeah, writing is just, I don't know, it's just a fascinating thing. And it's a really exciting time to be a writer for all these reasons, because there's so many different avenues you can explore. And you mentioned a good a good point there about that pressure. I find that sometimes these really like established authors uh, who've been around forever and have been doing this for decades, you'll notice that sometimes over time, fans will start, the reviews will change. And fans will be like, yeah, not as good as his early work, or mm-hmm. not as good as what she used to write. And that's because... I think since they need to write at least one book a year, maybe more, that they're under this pressure to write something just as brilliant as what made them a star. And that's just not necessarily sustainable if you have to just meet deadlines and you don't really have the time to put into creating what it, what you want it to be. So, I mean, do you find that because of that you know, regular job, if you will, that you, you don't have that pressure? You can kind of say, hey, I... Wh- it'll be out when it's where it should be. 100%. Um, And, you know, also, like, traditional publishing is slow. So, like, I sent a novel to my, a middle grade novel to my agent, I don't know how long ago, and she finally had time to look into it, read it, give me feedback. I gave her feedback back and forth. And then it's it's now on sub with publishers. Um, But publishers are taking a long time getting back because they're overworked and they're incredibly busy. Um, so I don't know when I'll hear back on that story. And so that's kind of in the works. And I just sent a new one to my agent. So she has that one. Um, and so I have to know that things in traditional publishing can take a long time. And um, which is not a bad thing because I can let them, you know, her take care of that stuff and I can write. Um, but it allows me to just take the time I need to take. So I am starting a new novel soon, but I'm like, I'm not quite ready to start that one yet because I need time to kind of brainstorm and get the story right. I'm really excited about this new one I'm about to write. I'm really excited about it, but it's been in my mind for about a year. And I'm just now like, I'm hoping to be able to start writing it in November or December, I'm not sure. But knowing that I can take that time, I can take that time to daydream about the world because it's going to be fantasy. Uh, It's going to be contemporary fantasy. Again, I can take time to dream about the world. I can take time to build my characters. I don't have to be rushed. I don't think I have to bring on a book next year. It really does take that pressure off me and allows me to just dive into the creative process. So I enjoy that. I mean, every, every write is different. You know, some people like the deadlines um, and like the pressure, but um, I have been enjoying having that that time to create. That's, that's terrific. Um, you mentioned The Princess and the Page, especially Scholastic has that one. As a kid, I do have happy memories of being in school and they would have like the Scholastic Book Fair, uh, yeah. like you know, Goosebumps or whatever they had, mm-hmm. the, the book fair. And it was just, uh, I don't know, book fairs were fun. Uh, yeah. they, they, all these titles and stuff and you know, the colorful oh. kind of things. and. Um, yeah, it's something magical about that. But when I know we were talking about the audiobooks earlier, so uh, you do have several audiobooks. I know obviously the Dream Heist is going to be an audiobook. Have you had a hand uh, in, uh, in selecting the narrator or providing any feedback on the recordings? I mean, I know as a writer, sometimes you may, um, you know, envision a certain voice uh, or accent or things like that, or even the pronunciation of certain words. I mean, I mentioned wrestling earlier. One of the biggest gripes wrestling fans have with audiobooks are that they often hire narrators who aren't wrestling fans and they will butcher the names of the people. And that is grating for the listener because they're like, oh, you're getting it wrong, right? So it's hard to kind of listen to it. So um, I'm not sure if you've ever had any influence or or, or, uh, feedback as part of that process, but I'd love your thoughts on that too. Yeah, so for both of my, um, the audiobooks for the Gilda series, Greta Jung is the one that my publisher had put forward. They said, hey, could you listen to her samples and see what you think? I listened to her and she was amazing and I absolutely loved her and she just did a fabulous job. 
So mm -hmm. I cannot say enough good things about her. Like on my first listening of her, um, I was really happy. So I had no problems with her doing it. And she took care of everything and did everything just phenomenally. Um, cannot say enough good things about her. Um, and then for my, the dream heist, I'm trying to remember who they chose. Um, they sent me, the, um, I'm trying to look. I, I, I would have to look, but, um, the lady, I feel terrible, but I can't remember who it is, but they sent me some samples and I got to have a say in that as well. So all, everything they sent me was amazing. I'm just super excited about that book as well. And I think they're going to do an amazing job, including, you know, I'm just really excited about for the dream heist as well. So I, you know, they do, uh, the publishers have always brought me into the process and there's always been an open discussion, but you know, it's funny, like both times I felt like the publisher really understood the vision that I had for mm -hmm. the story and they really matched the the narrator in a perfect way. Um, so I've just had great experiences so far with my, um, my choices. Um, yeah, I'll have to look that up. Um, but anyway, it's kind of exciting. So yeah, it's all been good, but Princess in the Page has not been in, put into um, audio, which maybe someday it will. You never know. Yeah, that's great. I'm happy to hear that they, uh, the publisher is working with you really well on the narrator, because the narrator, I like to say a narrator can take a great book to a whole different level. Uh, and I know I mentioned Stephen King before, but um, uh, I think the first audio book that really connected with me was It, um, because I listened to It, and it was narrated by Stephen Weber, the actor. And mm -hmm. wow, his narration is just incredible, because the way he would create these distinct voices and really just to kind of like inhabit the story. Uh, and it was a performance, but a performance in a way that elevated the material didn't necessarily get in the way of the story. So, um, and oftentimes people really connect with a, a narrator. In other words, Lee mm -hmm. Child's Jack Reacher series for many, many years, Dick Hill was the okay. voice of Jack Reacher. And lots of people would say Dick Hill's Jack Reacher. Like to them, th that's Jack Reacher. Uh, then Dick retired, and I think Scott Brick took over, who's a great narrator, too. But people are like, yeah, not Dick Hill. So yeah. people get very connected to the narrators. Um, and, um, yeah, it's just it's really just an interesting thing. Um, but I I'm delighted to hear that uh, your uh, audiobook experience has turned out well for your material. And, yeah, looking forward to listening to Dream Heist. Um, so any other exciting things on the horizon or any other uh, books or projects that you'd like to share with people or, you know, anything else about um, what you have available that you think people might find interesting? Yeah, I do have a number of things on the horizon. That are very exciting, very exciting. Um, but I cannot talk about them yet, uh, hopefully soon. Um, but contracts have been signed and things are moving forward, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then the mortal secret is my most recent kind of, kind of launch for this year. And that's going to be uh, another serial on Kindle Vela. And that is based on immortals, of course. Um, and a girl who has lost her memories and she's been cast out of her mortal race. And so she has to find her way back and find out what her powers are. Um, because it's, you know, it's going to be world changing for, you know, the moral races. Um, and then, um, I'm working on some other projects, um, that I'm working with my agent right now and those are kind of in the works still. So yeah, my most recent re release, it will be the dream heist and that will be in November. And I'm super excited about that coming into book format and audio format, which is really exciting. And, um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Great. And if anyone wants to, you know, follow along and see what you're up to and uh, all about your new releases, uh, where should they go? On my website, of course, everything will be on my website. And then, of course, I have all my social media. I have YouTube and Instagram and Twitter and all those. Um, but my website's my kind of my hub. And then everything kind of stems from that. So, yeah. Great. And then so for those who are um, uh watching basically uh, uh your website is christinafarley.com is that right yep. yes very and, good and, and then i think uh twitter instagram uh are both at christina farley facebook is christina farley author and youtube is uh what is your youtube channel 
So the Instagram actually is Christina. I want to say it's Christina L. Farley. I didn't quite get the Christina L. Farley. All right. Oh, yeah, you're right. Know. You are correct. I missed the L. Yeah. The sale for Lynn. Um, and then um, the YouTube is Chocolate Inspired is my name of my YouTube channel. All right. Are you just like a chocolate lover? I really am a chocolate lover, especially dark chocolate. I'm a little obsessed. Uh, with sea salt, right? <laughs> no, no sea salt. My husband oh, likes no sea salt. salt no sea salt. <laughs> No, just the plain chocolate. Actually, that's why I was so excited when we went to Peru. They have just amazing chocolate there. And that was really fun to experience. Yeah. Well, one of the growing up, speaking of stories and chocolate and all that, um, you know, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and, you know, Willy Wonka oh. and all that. I mean, to me, that always resonated, that movie. Um, because visually, it's amazing. It's a really incredible story. The characters... Yes. Um, the music, it's just, um, you know, magical. So uh, mm. that was always one of my favorite movies as a child. It, I think it still holds up even as an adult, you know? So magical. I was the, one of those kids who would go to the convenience store and get the, the, the Willy Wonka, ch the candy, and open it up and wonder if I would get a magical ticket. That's how real <laughs> it was for me. So I never got a ticket, though, but... That would have been cool. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Maybe that's a marketing promotion. In a future book, you could have like a golden ticket. And no, uh, I need to. And... That would be a good idea. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we'll have to give that some more thought. But this has been fantastic. Thank you so much, Christina, uh, for joining and everyone for tuning in. Uh, once again, this is Christina Farley, uh, you know, very gifted writer who's. Uh, uh, on the rise and doing exciting things and make sure to pre-order your copy of the dream heist uh right now mm -hmm. and look out for the audiobook version very soon um so thank you again for your time and for all your great insights really appreciate it thank you thank you so much for having me this is a lot of fun great talk <laughs>